I wondered whether you could see a role for psychologists in episodes of acute mental distress. Depends on the psychologist. <laughs> a good one. A good one, yeah. Yes, but quite often when, when we're experiencing severe mental distress, we can't talk about it to our nearest and dearest because nine times out of ten, they're the cause of it. Um, so that having someone who not just knows how to listen, listen, but who knows what to listen for can be enormously helpful. Over the years that I've worked as a psychologist, a lot of the depressed people who were coming and talking to me um, gave up being depressed. But they never did it in my room. <laughs> and they never did it in direct, you know, so that what I had said immediately caused them to become undepressed. You know, that's, it doesn't work like that. And so if we're thinking you can change somebody by asking them a series of questions or even by listening, you, you know, it, you might, you might not. I mean, I'm, you know, I've, I've met quite a lot of psychiatric patients who told me that they had never in the 10 or 20 years that they'd been a psychiatric patient, nobody had ever let them tell their story. You know, they'd had clinical interviews. So in the course of talking to me, uh, they'd tell me their story. I wasn't being a therapist. I was being told the story. But quite a number of those people found that that was all they needed to do. Um, you know, you didn't, I didn't have to do anything except listen. So the whole process whereby we change is individual and mysterious. A, a, a lot of the people I've known, when I meet them years afterwards, or they write to me, I've worked out a theory about why they changed. But it's never the same theory that they've worked out. It's always different. So the, just the notion that you can, as a therapist, achieve the end of making someone better, you know, life's not like that. People ruin theories, that's a the trouble. I'm very struck by what you talk about in relation to story. Um, yeah. And I want to apply it to a particular situation. Um, recently, a friend of my daughter-in-law, actually in Australia, tried to take her own life. And as she began either non-verbally or verbally to express yeah. that story, she was quite rapidly sectioned and was seen increasingly as, oh, she's getting worse, or she's, she's going downhill. Yeah. And I was struck by the fact that she was trying in various ways to tell a story. Yeah. I wondered how people who are working with people in that situation can help them to tell a story more readily. Um, Tim's book, really useful um, that, uh, to give you, because his book is that, because um, he, he starts off with his grandparents and he tells um, a story of his parents and his mother and how she saw her life and her role in it. And um, she married an ex-serviceman just after the war and they went to live in South Hall and, and the nice little house and she played tennis and, and brought up her three boys. South Hall started to go downhill. It wasn't the nice place. And so all these things that seemed... Um, quite small, but it all, her story no longer fitted and she didn't know how to change it. So what Tim says in his book, you know, when we can't change our story, that our only way to keep it is to kill ourselves. And you know, that's what we should all understand. That's why people kill themselves, because the story 
that they tell themselves about themselves no longer fits. And the only way to preserve the story is to kill yourself. And, um, it, and, it, and if, if we really understood that, quite possibly the Samaritans understand it because they just listen, they let people tell, tell their story. But, uh, and, and if people won't let you tell your story, then sometimes you do go to extremes, just trying, as you said, to tell it. worked in the health service for a long time I'm at the university now, but one of the things that always interests me when I ask people who are working in mental health is why they've come into to work in mental health. And without exception, everybody says that they do it because they're really interested in people, you know, and really interested in hearing their stories. <laughs> but what I then find is that, I've, and for me, I think it's, it's very hard to listen to people's stories when they're <laughs> difficult. It's hard to repeatedly listen to people's stories. It has an effect on the person who's listening. Yeah. And so I think what I've, what I've found over the years is that people, whatever their role is in mental health or in adult nursing or uh, adult uh, physical health, is that they find ways of avoiding to do the thing mm. that they thought they wanted to do from the beginning. So yeah. nurses spend a lot of time in the office writing fantastic care plans <laughs> without the person who they're writing the care plan about. Yeah. And uh, um, CBT is uh, fairly new to me. I've always found it quite difficult to engage with. But I suppose I think that CBT is another way of avoiding actually having to yes. listen to the person's yes. story. And I don't know what you think about that. Well, th it, it comes back to being truthful with yourself, isn't it? Because I know a lot, a, a lot of the people working as therapists um, will do exactly as what you've been describing, or they, they become, suffer from delusions of grandeur and they <laughs> hand down their, their interpretation. Um, but then there, there are others who, who are too truthful, you know, they're truthful to themselves and they know, I've, I've come to the end of the road here, this is as much mm. as I could do. And, and um, it's not burnout, it's just there's a certain amount of the world's sorrows that you can bear that close up. Mm. And, um, and it's best to recognise when, yeah, that will stop. And in any case, even when you say again and again, no, I, d I'm, I don't work as a therapist now. No, I stopped a long while ago. Doesn't stop anybody telling yeah. you their story. <laughs> so, you know, you're not going to miss out. <laughs> <laughs>